Hi there, it's Brian Sebastian, Movie Reviews and More, the Women's Broadcast TV Network, Worldwide TV. TV. I'm sorry, Women on TV. TV. I got some of the outlets now, and I2247 out of Tennessee. Okay, so this is going to be an interesting show because it's all about movies. Mike, I'm going to have you introduce your friend. Go ahead. Oh, hey, um, Mike Szymanski, uh, occasional co host with Brian Sebastian. I love doing this, and I am delighted to introduce um, Kyle Schickner, who is uh, an independent filmmaker who I've known for, gosh, um, well over a decade, maybe more. Two decades, um, two decades. oh my God. Yeah. And I knew him because he was, he was debuting this, uh, this uh, small movie about bisexuality at the DGA, at the D Directors Guild. Um, and I got to know him and I wrote about him as a journalist. And then he ended up moving into my house downstairs where Sharon Kane used to live. Nice. And, um, uh, and uh, I actually helped fund some of his projects through this uh, arts organization uh, that I'm a board member of called the California Institute of Contemporary Arts. I hope we get to talk about all of it. Um, uh, at least one of his movies is in my all time 10 favorite movies of all time, which is Steam. I have that right here. Oh. And, um, <clears throat> But I love I love many of his other movies, and I actually appear in one of them. So we can all talk about any of that. But uh, here is Kyle Schickner. Hey, how how's it, everyone? Good. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited about this, and I it's great to see you, Mike. Even if it's you know. Well, you're in New Jersey now, and I'm in L.A. And I am sadly I'm in New Jersey for at least five more years, and then I'm coming back to. So so just let those tenants know, Mike, that within like in five years they've got to let it let me come back. Okay, it's got your name on it. Hey Kyle, what's it feel like to have done those movies and always be way ahead of the genres or the business, but be relevant at the same time? And then turns out that the movies that you made back then are really relevant till this day. What's that feeling like for you? Uh, it, I mean, it's it's kind of it's it's two it's twofold. One, it's really it, 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 it's it's ego boosting and like oh I was I I, I was ahead of the trends. But at the same time, it's frustrating because, as as Mike can attest, like a number of my films, there was no necessary. At least Hollywood didn't think there was an audience for it, so it was very difficult to get um, any kind any kind of traction early on. Like the, the the movie Mike mentioned, where we met, was a movie called Rose by Any Other Name, which was about a lesbian that falls in love with a man and starts realizing that she's bisexual, and how that re how her friends or lesbian friends react and also how the man's straight friends react. Um, and this was in 95, 96, which is 15 years before. I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't even know if I can get that movie because even bisexuality today is still not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's people aren't rushing to, 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 to give money to bisexual projects. But um, back then it was, even doing a movie about lesbians was crazy. If I had just done that, it would have been simpler. Even maybe if I had made Rose a gay man falling in love with the woman might have been a little more. So that was that was interesting. I you know there was that. So that's frustrating. I did another movie, um, Strange Fruit, which which is about a gay man, gay black man in Louisiana in 2000 who gets lynched, and the cops cover it up. And it's funny because I went to about 60 film festivals with that movie trying to get it sold. And um, there were two things about that. Is one was um, I kept hearing, when I was trying to sell it, when I was trying to get it made, I kept hearing from uh, fairly large studios, you know, independent studios, we love the movie, uh, the lead can't be gay and black. He can be black or he can be gay, but he can't be both. Hollywood does not, the people don't want to see a movie about gay black men. Um, and part, and so what, you know, I disagreed and we made it. We were probably in every gay, gay film festival in the country because there were very few gay black films back then. But the other thing about that was when I was going to film festivals, um, I would hear from a lot of white audience members. And never, never, when the, once a person of color said this, but a lot of white audience members said to me, this is unbelievable because in 2002, uh, cops would never be able to cover up a murder. Huh. And, I, and I would, it would drive me crazy. I'm like, no, they would and they do. And now, you know, obviously what's going on now with this revolution in this country, it's like, they do, they have, and they do all the time. And so I wish I could sort of go back and just like meet those people and say, see, see. So yeah, so it's good to be a little bit ahead of the curve. It's also, you know, it makes the, makes the, 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 the climb up a little harder, but if it's not hard, it's not really worth it. 
Well, and I'm, I'm maybe breaking some confidences here, but it, it's some really funny things is that a couple of times Kyle was invited to film festivals, they thought that he was black. And because he had such a connection to the, to, to you know, the, the, the black filmmaking and the black voice, he, you know, he, that, the, the stories that he was doing. And I think there was one film festival, right? They were surprised that you showed up and you were, you were not a person of color. I mean- uh, well, A bunch of them were. And in fact, there was a film <laughs> festival in, in Los Angeles, I won't mention the name, and they were very good, but they actually had booked me on a panel about black, film, black films. And then um, it was funny because about a week before, I hadn't heard anything from them. I'm like, well, what's, when am I gonna, what's going on? So I, you know, I reached out to them. And the woman in charge was like, you know, uh, we sort of took you off. We thought you were black. And we don't want to have a white filmmaker on the panel about, about black film, which I got on one hand. But on the other hand, I also felt it would have been an interesting perspective from a white man's perspective of making this film that as a complete, like, boost to, I, I felt really validated and glad that people did think I was black, that someone didn't see this movie and say, no way someone of color made this because it doesn't ring true. Um, so that sort of felt good. I also got like a, in San Francisco, there was a $500 like cash, re cash award for being in the, you know, and they didn't tell the audience at the Q and A because they thought the audience would get so upset. And they told me at behind the, behind the uh, afterwards, say, here's your money. We didn't, we didn't, uh, do, we didn't want to do this in front of you. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that was interesting. But again, uh, you know, the interesting fact about that is I've, I've had that happen to me many times where on the phone I would be invited to something. Oh, like, oh, we didn't know you were black. I'm like, that's because I don't sound black. I, 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 I learned proper English. That's what I used to tell them. And then they go, well, you're not a black outlet. I'm like, no, it says movie reviews and more. I didn't want it to be about being of color. And then, you know, Mike's heard the story a couple yeah. of times. You know, I've been disinvited to black events because I wasn't a black outlet. And I would look at my hand like this, because it's on the phone. And I said, well, I'm still black. I still know people in the film. I still am gonna talk about the film. So I still go, no, you're not a black outlet, so we can't invite you. And then I said, okay, F you, I'm not gonna ever do anything like that. So I didn't do the NAACP awards. I didn't do the image. I didn't do any of that stuff because of that. And I said, I'll show yeah. you guys. So, you know, it turns out today, Mike, we have 18,000 views this week. We still got two more days to go. Uh, we have 885,000 views out of Tennessee. We'll reach 900K in two days on a company that I didn't even know anything about. We just happened to do it. And then we, you know, we're 19,000 views on the last 28 days on our YouTube channel. All because people said, of what you went through, Kyle, just because we're not of a certain race or whatever or genre, that doesn't mean it can't be done. Right, right. And, you know, and I no, the stuff can be done because we've done it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and part of part of my mission with my filmmaking company is sort of to, as a white man, and I learned this early on when I moved to LA, was I would move to LA with this movie I told the Bros by the name, and then I quickly got meetings and 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 uh, and doors were opened immediately, and I would hang out with people of people women and uh, people of color who have much more talented than I had been around much longer would be frustrated saying, I, I, how, that's, uh, not, it's unfair. Like, just because I'm a woman or just because I'm, I'm, I'm not white, I have to do twice as, to be twice as good and try twice as hard to get the same meetings I did by just putting out a movie and, and renting the DGA for one night. I mean, and you know, it's, so I tried to make films. First of all, my movies only, we only to make, take, make films that tell the story of either people of color women or the LGBT community. Um, they're not necessarily political films, but those are the, the leads. It's about that, it's, that's, that's the stories we're telling. Part of it was because I felt, again, Hollywood's wrong. And I think I've been proven now after 20 years of that, like there is an audience for women in films, with, with films that are chick flicks or that are based towards women. And there's obviously an audience for people of color, both straight, gay, uh, anywhere in between, LGBT, all of it. Um, and sort of, there was enough movies about straight white men, I felt, and I didn't want to add to that noise. What were some of the panels like when you were on those panels and then they found out what you were, that you were happened to be the white director who made a great black film? What was that? What were some of the responses of that? 90% uh, of it was really positive. It's funny, when we first started the festival route, I was really geared to get a lot of pushback. 
And for the first maybe 10, 15 festivals, I didn't get that at all. So I kind of relaxed. And then I was at Frameline Film Festival in San Francisco, the big gay lesbian festival out there. And it was, it, I showed up and there was like a line around the block. And I was like, and again, I was the only black film on the whole, in the whole week of the show. I, I was shocked that there were that many people there. Um, and I was sort of got a little cocky of like, yeah, 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 I know what I'm talking about. And San Francisco people don't play. Like, you've got to become correct. And sort of there was a, after the movie ended, they introduced me in the beginning and the, the, the audience seemed to really like me. The movie ended and there's a controversial ending. And as I was walking up to do the Q&A, there were people hissing. And I thought, that's curious. They really liked me before. So there was a segment of people that had issues with, and I, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't argue with that, had issues with a white man shouldn't be telling the story of a gay black man getting lynched. Now, I don't necessarily... And what was always interesting was it became a debate between other people in the audience. And so he would stand up and say, well, then why, are, why isn't our community making it? We can't be mad at him because we're not making it. Um, so, you know, it was always interesting. I mean, at that festival, they actually gave me an escort home because they were worried about my safety. Um, there was about four or five people in the audience that were really upset by, um, by the film. By, by what was portrayed in the film, or perhaps that I made the film, and perhaps early on my cavalier beginning with the Q and A when I was sort of not prepared for what I what I was would get. Um, but I always said I don't want pe when people leave my films at the end when they walk into the theater, the last thing I want them to think, the first thing is, what do you want to get to eat? I want them to, I don't I want them to feel something. If they hate me, great. They're thinking, they're talking about something. Maybe someone at that festival, some young filmmaker, saw it, said, screw this. I'm not gonna let this, this white guy make a movie about us. I'm gonna make a movie about us and then did that. And that would be great if that was somehow a, a spark for somebody out there. There were people who were jealous. I gotta tell you this too. I know this, you know, uh, but there were people who were jealous that he got to do work with Ruby D. Ruby D was impossible to get uh, towards the end of her life. He worked with her on her last movie and it's the most beautiful portrayal and, and, uh, a beautiful scene where she sings Ave Maria. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's, and talk about that. Talk about how you got convinced Ruby D to be part of this. Um, yeah, I, first of all, that that was by far the highlight of my career. Um, I, I didn't know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was really floundering after high school. I was a jock, and I, there's not. I certainly wasn't a good enough jock to even play well in college. And so I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. And I, and I liked writing. And I remember going to see Do the Right Thing in the theater. I didn't really know much about Spike Lee. I knew a couple of his films, and I, and, and, but I liked Public Enemy, and I heard there was a song by Public Enemy. And I, that, I remember watching that movie and right away saying, like, wow, I didn't know movies can do this. And I fell in love with both Ruby Dee and Ozzy Davis, who were in that movie. And I was upset and angry with myself that I had no idea who Ruby Dee was at that point. I had no idea the storied career she had. I could probably list 10 white actresses of, that, of her generation, and I didn't know who she was, and that was upsetting to me. So I started to write a movie, and I wrote it with her and Ozzie Davis in mind. And, you know, we got it, I got it done, and there was some interest, and I, and I told you this earlier, Brian, but I'll mention this, sort of going back to a studio that wanted to do the film, people really wanted to do this film, and it's a story about three different women and three different stories, basically, and they're intermingled. And two or three studios, larger studios now than with Strange Fruit, said to me, we love this. Then we need to do two things. One, we need to get rid of the old black lady. No one needs to see that story. No one's interested. Now to me, it was all about Ruby D. Even if I, even, you know, that, she's the heart of the story. The other one was, we need to have a few more lesbian sex scenes. So I knew right away that wasn't, so, so she was on board and she, she, she was, they were interested initially. And I don't think she had read the script yet. And then that fell through the money few years later, and it took but time between the time I wrote it and the time I made it, it was 10 years. And this was sort wow. of the movie I wanted to make. And I made these other ones in between. They couldn't get the financing for this one. Um, finally got to financing. And they, that, that year, about six, eight months before, Ozzie Davis had passed. Her husband had passed. And the story is about this woman whose husband has just recently died. And she used to sing in church with her, with her husband. And since he has died, she refuses to sing. She won't sing anymore. And so I talked to her manager, her agent, and he said, look, she's really retiring. She's just finishing one movie with Denzel as a favorite to Denzel. That was American, uh, gang American Gangster. 
um, which she was up for the Golden Globe and Oscar for. Um, but she's probably, she's not going to do it, but I'll send it to her. And I got a call from her about a week later, and it was, and, and it was the most amazing thing she said. After Ozzy died, I had stopped wanting to act. It was a thing we had together. And reading your script, reading your, your portrayal of this woman, I know Ozzy would want me to continue to act and would want me to continue to have joy. And he's still here with me, even though he's not here with me. So I want to do this movie. And like, even now I'm still, I get goosebumps. Cause like, you know, this woman who is, first of all, incredible actress, but also groundbreaking, like I, that I could slightly make her life a little bit more, more happy is just wonderful to me. Well, and, and just one more wrote it, The fact that you wrote it 10 years prior to that too, because Mike, how many times have we heard a filmmaker, whether it's male, female, black or white, uh, say that the studio loves our script, but you need to do this. <laughs> if you love it so much, you make it just how it is. And they're usually wrong. They're usually wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I, it's funny because I will look back now that I'm, you know, much older, I look back and think, what if, what if, what if I had said yes to, to changing strange fruit? Would I be, would I have gotten more, what if I had gotten rid of the, like, but I, Immediately, I think, well, it's not worth it. It just wouldn't be worth it to me. I've had a really, really great life. I love the movies I've made. I'll continue to make more movies. Have they reached AMC status? Have they reached the plateau I would like them to reach? No, but I know I can sleep at night. And I don't want to sound too pompous and grandiose, like, oh, you don't sleep at night. Because I don't think it's selling out. But for me, there, these were changes that weren't, that changed the, the fabric of what I was trying to tell the story. And now, now I'm just a, a guy they're hiring to say action. What would have happened if you did say yes? How do you think it would have come out? I think it would have come out crappy. I think it would have, I, you know because what I think you, would have Because you would have given in, right? Part of me would have given in, but I also think, I think it could have come out, let's just say with Strange Fruit, for instance. I think it would have been fine, but I think the, more, the audience I was making it for, uh, the LGBT community, the black LGBT community, they would have sat and, and said what I have said a hundred times was, why couldn't he be gay? Like, why couldn't he be gay? Or how come he had to be white? There would be that whitewashing. And so I think it would have, the audience that embraced Strange Fruit and embraced Steam would have been the ones, the first ones to look away. And it might have gotten more, more audience, but not the, that seems, this seems obnoxious to say, but not the right audience. There's enough movies for that audience there was no movies for gay black men back then. I mean, they, literally, there were, there, were, there were two at the time. We all, I got to know the filmmakers, we're all on the same circuit. So, you know, so I think, you know, that's what I think would have happened. I think it would have been fine, but the audience that, what, what it was made for wouldn't have been happy with it. You know, it's, and that's not worth it to me. Kyle and, and Mike, look what happened the last five years at the Oscars. Think of Moonlight, you think of Green Book. Uh, I, I look at it this way way ahead of your time and, and i love people like yourself i think i i think i'm like that we're way ahead and we're waiting for people to catch up to us we're turning around where are they are we the only one on this path the answer is yes we are because we we created our own path and then we have to like we have to show them which way to go this is an easier route yeah it's going to be hard but you will benefit from going this route instead of taking the same over two paths yeah i mean yeah i i you're right and again i don't like to to me, politics is very important. To me, giving, at the end of my life, I want to have given more than I've taken. But I am, I am a selfish man. Mike will be the first one to tell you that. I am not the kind of person that will go occupy Wall Street for, six, for 60 days and not shower. I'm not the one on the front line because I'm afraid of, like, I'm not that guy. So what can I do to make this world a little bit better? And for me, the only thing I really can offer is filmmaking. It's sort of that's what I do and that's what I try to do um, with what I do. And sometimes it's, you know, a horror movie that I made that happens to be the lesbian is the lead. And it's, it's a completely exploitative horror movie that happens to have a strong female lesbian lead. And it's not political at all, but there may be a tell, woman. Tell us a, tell us a name, Paradise Lost, right? Paradise Lost is the name of that film, yep. Shot in the Dominican Republic. On Vimeo now. It's on Vimeo now. It was the worst month of my life, but 
everyone else had a great time. Just filming a movie, a low budget horror movie in the Dominican Republic in the middle two thousands is not. A Why did idea. you put yourself in the movie too? Was that uh, uh, where you were? You play the um, kind of uh, host kind of thing. It, it did was it hard for for you to also be in a movie? I know you've done it a couple of times, but. Um, uh, how was your M. Night Sh Shyamalan uh, uh, moment in that film? <laughs> part, of it is, part of it was a budgetary thing. It was like we're flying a lot of people across from California to Dominican Republic. It's one less airfare. It's one less. So part of it was that. It's a small role. Um, for the, the movie's about like a, a low-end survivor type reality show that goes horribly wrong and there's a killer on the island. I play the Jeff Probst kind of character who's the host. And it's a small kind of role. Um, and the other thing is like, it's playing. Like I wanna, I wanna play. I put myself as a small role in Steam because I wanted to do a scene with Ali Sheedy, even if I had two lines with her. You know, I did, you know, so it's, it's you know, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna try to, you know, have as much fun as I can without ruining the final product because I'm certainly not an actor. <laughs> Well, you haven't ruined your movies like M. Night has done a few times on his. No, yes, I, 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 yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't ruin them as an actor. I may have ruined them as a writer, director, but not as an actor. <laughs> well, no, and the, uh, this is a good transition into your, uh, the project that you're working on now, White Man Goes Into a Black Barber Shop. Tell us a little bit about that. It's a documentary uh, called The White Man Walks Into a Barber Shop, and it's about racism in America. It's been, I've been working on it for a long time and I would work on it and we'd get closer and we, actually what we did was we, um, we got a grant from the uh, CIDC, from the California Institute of Creative Arts um, and I drove around the country going to black barber shops and churches and fraternities and any, any, anywhere talking about race and the thought process was when I was coming up um, we had shows like All in the Family and Good Times and uh, musicians like James Brown and Muhammad Ali. Like there were people that politics and, and entertainment were intertwined. And we talked about race and, and anything. Oh, you watch All in the Family, I watch it still every time it's on. The, the stuff they talked about is unbelievable that they did it in the early 70s because we could not get it on the air today. Um, and my feeling was the race situation in America is gotten worse in the last 20 years in the sense that we're not allowed to talk about it. We're not allowed to discuss race. So as a white man who has a lot of guilt, and that's what the movie's sort of about. It's like, I know I'm not like the guys in Charlotte, Charlottesville or the, 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 the people who the Trump supporters who are openly racist. So there's a thing with white liberals that they can see that they're not that. So they feel superior. But when you look at people like the dog walker in Central Park who gave money to Obama's campaign, but knew how to weaponize this man's color by saying, I'm being, I'm being threatened by a black man to the cop. She's a liberal in her mind. And she would probably never say she was racist. But my feeling was, I can't be not racist growing up in this country. It's just impossible. Just the culture is all inundated with having to be racist. In the same way, I can't be sexist, but I can work on it. And white liberals do work on it. But at some point, I think we stop and think, we're done. We're not really racist because we're not overtly oppressing. We're not overtly, you know, whatever it is. And it was wanting to go around the country and have open conversations with people about everything, not just political, just sports, whatever, whatever it would be. You know what I'm saying? And, and that was sort of the motivation behind it. And sort of, it was an amazing experience. We shot like 80 hours of footage and, you know, it was incredible. What did you learn from that? Because I think that's brilliant on your, I'm surprised no one's done that before. I believe it. It's taken me very long and I was so scared it was, someone eventually was going to do it before I got a chance to get mine out. Um, it was, it was, what did I learn? I learned that, I learned that people of color are a lot nicer than they should be. Like they are, so, they, the, the, the hospitality and the kindness and the opening themselves up um, to a bunch of white people coming in. And I, and, I, and I didn't plan anything. I arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, 
found a barbershop, walked in myself alone and said, can I shoot here with my crew for an hour or so talking about anything? So it wasn't any, anything was a plan. So, and everyone, everyone said yes. Everyone in let us in. Um, uh, we shot like two blocks away from where George Floyd was murdered um, at a barbershop. And it was, it, was, it was one of the more interesting things. So, so that's the first thing, that black people are, are a lot more nicer than they should be, um, and that, that we have a right to expect them to be. Um, the other thing I learned was that, that guilt, the white guilt runs very deep, like deeper than I, I was even aware of. I know what it is, but it's like, you know, to be aware of, and, and I think the stuff that's going on in the country now, um, it'll be interesting to see because there seems to be a shift of even white people are saying this is crazy. Um, whereas even four years ago when the Black Lives Matter thing started, there was a lot of white people resisting this. And there's still a lot of idiots resisting it. But I think, I think there's been a, and it's, it's a perfect storm of Trump and Corona and them, but it's so, so just finding out how badly I think white people, uh, I'll be, I'll be generic white people want to be liked by black people. Um, and, <laughs> I, I'm you know, and, and that because I know what you mean. I, I, I grew up in an all white town in East Lyme, Connecticut, where Lyme disease came from. Uh, there was only three black families out of 7,000. Uh, and it was interesting because I was the most popular person there. And they had Ku Klux Klan members there I don't know who they were. Believe me, I was trying to find out. But also when we moved into the neighborhood, we moved into an upscale uh, white neighborhood. We were the first black family moved in. Don't you know, two older white families moved out right away. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, we had a nice long driveway, like the driveways that you would see in the South that went for like a half mile. I remember someone said, oh, that couple's moving out because you guys moved in. I go, really? So I, I, I would just like wait for them to move out because I, I ran out to the end of the driveway and I purposely waved at them like this. And the lady looked like this on her head. And I never got that. I go, oh, yeah. well, you know, I, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, but people like me. But I never forgot that. So when I started doing all these things, I was always the first, the only person of color in the room. Always. And then I would be like, wow, there's another person of color coming here. That's interesting. What are they doing here? <laughs> I, I, it was always interesting. Mike, you've been in those junket rooms like that. I, and I would be the only person there. And I always make sure I sat next to the talent, no matter who they were. I wanted to make sure that they remembered either my name, Sebastian, or, oh yeah, that's the black guy that I always sit next to in the radio room, whatever. I wanted to be that person that they never forgot. So I could, I totally understand what you're uh, talking about because I would go through that being the person who's not a black outlet, not associated with anything like that, going through that myself. And it was very interesting. You know, it's, I, I, I find it interesting, and, and as a uh, open out bisexual man, it's interesting because people will often expect me to always, like, if I don't make a movie that's about bisexuality, like they, they're, they're like, I, I have to define myself completely by white, by, uh, you know, what I'm saying male, and that doesn't, you know, doesn't be the case. And I had an interview where a woman say, asked me like you know, when am I going to make another bisexual film? And my reaction was, um, every film I make is bisexual. It comes from this perspective of who I am, where I grew up, and what I experienced. Just like, you know, you don't, you know, you're a black man. No, one, no one's being shocked by that once we see it. Um, and to make that all about all you are is, is, is so facile and, and, and reductive. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. And we got about uh, five minutes. What do you got coming up and what's your perspective on what you're seeing in New Jersey now? So perspective of seeing New Jersey in terms of what exactly? Everything in, terms of, in the world now. New Jersey, you know, New Jersey, I wish I was in LA, although you guys are spiking now. And I don't know what you guys are doing. You guys had it all going on. But, um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, and, you know, I thought L.A. was going to be my home for my life and, and situations happen and I'm here. Um, uh, I love L.A. I miss L.A. There's nothing like New York. Um, I are, think you, you have protests there now, right? Protests, protests are going on. In fact, you know, my stepdaughter is, you know, 
volunteering and you know for Black Lives Matter and doing protests in largely white communities um, where they're inviting Black Lives Matter to come in and, and facilitate this, which is great. Um, I think I think we do, I live in a very 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 conservative town. Um, Chris Christie lives here, Governor Chris Christie, um, uh, and so that is hard because I really for for about two or three years thought I was the only Democrat in this whole town. It was scary. It was not scary, but it was it, it was it was certainly lonely. I certainly had grown lived in in, in, a, in a liberal town in New Jersey and then lived in LA, so I was used to being the majority in terms of the political awareness and then to move to a, a place that's very sort of like hostile towards liberal people like we've had we had three hillary signs stolen the fourth one we put up they burned on our lawn oh my um, god <laughs> so, <laughs> you know so that's the so black guy we, in the neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> exactly and i was you know and and, and again it's, it's it's the kind of thing that um you know, as a white guy, I'd never experienced at all. You know, like we talked about that, that the, the, the dog walker. I think that was a moment for white people to think, we understand police brutality on some level, but the idea of just having to navigate being not white in our country is deeper than I think any white person will ever, ever obviously understand. But I think those couple moments are, were big clicks for a lot of people like, Jesus, he's a bird walker. Like what, he, what, you know what I'm saying? There's, and so, um, it's good that I'm close to New York. It's good I'm in a liberal state. Um, but the town is, the town is the town. If that gives you any answers. And, you know, and, and I'm still, you know, making movies. My movies are all up on Vimeo now. I got a couple web series. I'm hopefully White, white Man Walks Into a Barbershop will be out um, by the fall. Who knows? I don't even know what out means. A number of festivals are reaching out to me already. They've heard about it, but who knows what that's going to look like? Are there going to be film festivals? Is there going to be movies? I, I don't know. Yeah, so, out this to streaming stuff. It's very strange. No, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I don't nobody, know if I feel Nobody does. Those. No. And I love going to the movies. I love that communal aspect of it. But I know I certainly am not going to be comfortable going into a theater right now in the net for a while, honestly, unfortunately. And that's what I was going to ask you, because I, I think, Mike, we were talking about it last time. I'm not going to go to the movie theaters, and I'm a movie whore. It's not the time yet. They're just not prepared yet. Plus, there's no movies to see. Mike, would you go to the movies in the next couple hours or the next day or so? Would you go? Only if I were the only one in the theater. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. And I think that... Um, you know, I think they're, start, they're starting, they're, they're announcing they're getting released in, start July 17th, movies are going to start coming out. And there's a bunch of movies I want to see, but I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not comfortable. Let's just... You have to see the Bond movie in a theater. You can't watch that on, I don't care how big your screen is, you can't watch that anywhere but a theater. I'm a huge Marvel Cinematic Universe guy. Like, I don't, I want to see uh, Scar, I mean, um, uh, Black Widow in the theater, but Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman. Yeah, got yeah. I mean, I, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Like, I can see the Irishman on a on a TV because one, I've got to take six bathroom breaks because it's so damn long. But the other <laughs> thing, you know, it's not as, as as explosive. See, I purposely went to go see it because I wanted to see it on the big screen. I went to Lemley's in North Hollywood to see it. Hey, my, uh, Mike. Um, yeah, you and I agree. We would be, we would have to be the only one in the theater because it's it's airborne now. That's what people don't forget. So you got to wear the mask to the concession. You got to wear it into the theater. You got to wear it out the theater. How do you eat your popcorn? Yeah, you know what happens if someone sneezes there? We've seen the movie Outbreak. It is literally like that now, right? And yeah. I know in the movies with Mike. Like Mike likes his popcorn. I do. I do. I need to have my big bucket. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Mike, talk about your writing and your books real quick. Okay, I got my, my books, uh, uh, my Dachshund books on Amazon and my uh, Mickey Ski books um, are also on Amazon uh, that you can get on Kindle and, um, and uh, by paperback as well. And, and for the people that don't know, what, you know, Mike on the Art of Montague, they're liking, you just submitted something the the spiked and sponsors I mean um in um, oh Rachel the Rachel uh, profile Rachel Mason's profile I did last week they really like that and it just like doubly spiked up which is interesting you have a following that you don't know of and I keep telling you that outside the U S they really like what you're writing 
And then Kyle, give you social media links. Uh, the social, I'm, I'm old. I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm, you can, um, Kyle Schickner is on, on uh, Instagram, which I hardly post, and, you know, Facebook, Kyle Schickner. My movies are on uh, Vimeo. They're, the movies are called Full Frontal, which is a mockumentary about the gay porn world. There you go. I'm in that one, so you might want to pass that one. Uh, Rosemary, their name, uh, web series, Steam. You got that? Paradise Lost, um, all of those, in, and you could, that's also under my name on Vimeo if you want to rent them. And I'm Brian Sebastian, so for Mike Szymanski, Kyle, excellent films, you know, your visionary stuff, do not lose it, keep it going. I'm Brian Sebastian, Movie Reviews and More, IT247 and Worldwide TV Network, womanontv.tv. We will see you next week.